The Wedding of Queen Victoria As an unmarried young woman, Queen Victoria was required by social convention to live with her mother, despite their differences. Her mother was consigned to a remote apartment in Buckingham Palace, and Victoria often refused to see her. When Victoria complained to Lord Melbourne, her Prime Minister, that her mother's proximity promised torment for many years, Melbourne sympathised but said it could be avoided by marriage, which Victoria called a shocking alternative. Queen Victoria's family had hoped that one day she might marry her cousin, Prince Albert, son of Ernest I, Duke of saxe coburg and Gotha, and nephew of Victoria's mother, the Duchess of Kent. Albert and Victoria were of a similar age, Albert being just three months younger. That was not the only similarity they held. Victoria and Albert had been delivered by the same midwife. The wedding of Queen Victoria and Albert of saxe coburg and Gotha was a lavish and sumptuous affair, which took place on the 10th of February 1840 at St James's Palace. We are all going stark staring mad. Nothing is heard or thought of but doves and cupids, triumphal arches and wit favours, and last but not least, variegated lamps and general illuminations. This lament was published in the journal of the satirist during the preparations for Queen Victoria's wedding to Prince Albert on the 10th of February 1840. With the engagement being formally announced the previous November, royal wedding fever had gripped the nation. Victoria had ascended the throne in June 1837, just a month after her 18th birthday. To many in Victorian society, Victoria was dismissed as being youthful and ill-equipped for the duties and responsibilities that lay ahead. Therefore, it was not expected that she would rule alone for long. Victoria wrote of the prospect of taking a husband in her journal. I dreaded the thought of marrying. I was so accustomed to having my own way that I thought it was ten to one that I shouldn't agree with anybody. However, Victoria found herself in previous good company. Like another earlier Queen Regnant, Elizabeth I, she was concerned that her husband might wish to dampen her powers. She therefore began to take the view that perhaps marriage was not meant for her. Victoria's family, courtiers and the government, on the other hand, had other ideas. It had been years since Victoria had last seen Albert. The occasion was when he and his brother Ernest had paid a visit to London just before her 17th birthday in May of 1836. Victoria had recorded in her journal that he was extremely handsome, his hair is about the same colour as mine, his eyes are large and blue, and he has a beautiful nose and a very sweet mouth with fine teeth. And he was full of goodness and sweetness and very clever and intelligent. Many balls and entertainments had been arranged ahead of Victoria's main birthday event. Albert had not been prepared. By the time the day arrived on the 24th of May, he had reached breaking point. He stayed a short while in the ballroom and having only danced twice, turned as pale as ashes and went home early. However, all was not lost. Although Albert had not enjoyed the pomp one thing was clear to all, that Albert and Victoria had in fact got on very well and enjoyed each other's company. Victoria cried bitterly, very bitterly, when eventually he packed up and left the palace to return home to Germany. Despite the evident connection between the pair, Victoria was still not being forthright about any prospect of her marriage. Victoria was still under pressure. She could feel it from the press, who were publishing speculation about whom the young queen would marry. The eligible bachelors were the subject of conversation in Victorian high society. Talk grew stronger and led to even more public speculation when Victoria was persuaded to invite Albert and his brother for another visit to court. They arrived at Windsor on the 10th of October 1839. This time around, however, Victoria was love-struck. Absence really did make the heart grow fonder. It was the first time she had laid eyes on Albert in three years. Victoria had matured and Albert grown more distinguished. She declared in her journal, Albert's beauty is most striking. He is so amiable and unaffected. In short, very fascinating. He is excessively admired here. Victoria wrote to her Prime Minister four days later 
telling him that she had changed her mind about marrying. Melbourne was delighted with her change of heart and approved of her choice, writing that Albert seems a very agreeable young man. He certainly is a very good looking one and as to character that we must always take our chance of. Convention dictated that as monarch, Victoria was to be the one to make the marriage proposal. With Albert firmly set in her sights and her mind made up, she wasted little time in doing so. On the 15th of October at midday, Victoria requested the company of Albert. Once he arrived, Victoria asked him to marry her. He agreed and they embraced. Victoria wrote of the occasion in her journal and could not conceal her joy. Oh, how I adore and love him, I cannot say. Albert, it seems, held the same view. He confided in a friend, I have obtained the height of my desire. Lord Melbourne and Victoria set about planning the wedding ceremony. It was hoped that the wedding would further increase her popularity. Victoria had very different ideas about how her wedding should look and feel. She wanted something different to those who had gone before her. Royal weddings in the past had been small private ceremonies, usually held late at night, but Victoria changed all that. She had the idea that the bridal procession drive to St James's Palace, where the wedding was to be held, should be visible by the public. She also outdid previous royal weddings by inviting more guests than ever before. Victoria's ideas about her dress were equally as decided. She refused to wear her crimson velvet robes of state. Instead, she opted for a dress of pure white and simple magnificence. This enhanced her purity and innocence, but had a more practical effect too. It made her more visible to the thousands of people who turned out to watch the procession. Wedding dresses at the time usually used Brussels lace. However, Queen Victoria commissioned Honiton lace for her wedding dress. The idea and statement was clear to all. She wished to support and revive the British lace industry in Honiton, Devon. Queen Victoria described her choice of dress in her journal. I wore a white satin dress with a deep flounce of Honiton lace, an imitation of an old design. My jewels were my Turkish diamond necklace and earrings and dear Albert's beautiful sapphire brooch. The dress was worn again at the wedding of her eldest child, Vicky, in 1858 and of her grandson, the future George V, in 1893. In further support of English industry, her dress was made of East London Spitalfield silk. In so doing, she established a tradition that would be observed the world over. The Queen's dress had the added advantage of being easy to replicate, thus sparking the craze for women across the country copying royal bridal fashions. She opted for a headdress of orange blossoms instead of a tiara, although Albert did design a new coronet for her as a wedding present. In modern times, that very same coronet hit the headlines when someone tried to sell it and an export ban was placed upon it to stop it leaving the country. Victoria also chose white as a colour for her 12 bridesmaids. But deciding who should fulfil this role proved problematic thanks to Albert's demand that they should each be born of a mother of spotless character. This was all very well in theory, but in practice many court ladies had enjoyed affairs with Victoria's wicked uncles, all of whom had preferred mistresses to wives. Further problems were presented by the fact that the Chapel Royal at St James's Palace could only accommodate 300 people at a push. So whittling down the guest list was a challenge. A beautiful ring had been given to the Queen on the occasion of her wedding by her beloved sister Theodore. It showed a crowned double heart and was inscribed in French, United Forever. Victoria was not exempt from causing political controversy. She achieved this by only inviting five Tories, which revealed her bias towards the Whig party. When the wedding day finally dawned, the bride awoke to pouring rain but this did nothing to dampen her spirits. How are you today? And have you slept well? She wrote cheerfully to her bridegroom. Outside the crowds had been braving the rain since eight o'clock. They cheered when they saw the young queen pass by in her carriage, wearing her beautiful but simple white gown and a diamond necklace and a sapphire brooch that my angel Albert had given me. Despite being dressed in the scarlet and white uniform of a British field marshal, the groom apparently failed to make a favorable impression. 
Florence Nightingale in the crowd observed that he appeared to be wearing clothes, no doubt borrowed, to be married in. Victoria's father had died when she was a baby, so she was given away by the Duke of Sussex. As they processed through the state rooms to the Chapel Royal, the bridesmaids, whom one guest complained were dressed so simply that they looked like village girls, struggled to cope with Victoria's 18-foot-long train and kept treading on each other's feet. But the bride was delighted with them and recorded that they made a beautiful effect in their white dresses adorned with white roses. Despite her earlier concerns about marriage eroding her power, the Queen insisted on keeping the vow to obey. This sparked concerns about Albert's political role, although it would be soon become obvious that Victoria was unwilling to obey anybody. In her journal, she described the ceremony as very imposing and fine and simple, and I think ought to make an everlasting impression on everyone who promises at the altar to keep what he or she promises. The wedding breakfast was held at Buckingham Palace. Shortly before it was due to begin, Victoria gave Albert a ring, and he told her that they should never keep any secrets from each other. The couple had ordered a hundred cakes, to be eaten on the day and the rest to be distributed among relations, ambassadors, household and state officials. The wedding cake itself weighed in at 300 pounds, nine foot in circumference and 16 inches high. Little wonder that it took four men to carry it. It was decorated with a figure of Britannia flanked by cupids, one holding a book bearing the date of the wedding. The Times reported, we are assured that not one of the cherubs on the royal wedding cake was intended to represent Lord Palmerston. The resemblance therefore pointed out must be purely accidental. In modern times, a slice of Queen Victoria's original wedding cake fetched £1,500 at auction. The cake, which had survived from Queen Victoria's wedding to Prince Albert in 1840, was sold by Jersey collector David Gainsborough Roberts. As soon as the banquet was over, the Queen changed into a white silk travelling gown and set off with her new husband for Windsor Castle. The diarist Charles Greville grumbled that the coat was shabby and they had only a small escort. But, as Victoria had predicted, her choice pleased a people weary of the excess of her uncles. She wrote that there was an immense crowd quite deafening us all the way to Windsor. While photography existed in 1840, the techniques were not yet fully developed. A series of photographs taken by Roger Fenton on the 11th of May 1854 of Victoria and Albert are often described as wedding or reenactment photographs, with the dress identified as her wedding dress. The Royal Collection has refuted these interpretations, stating that these images are the first photographs to show Victoria as a queen rather than as a wife or mother, and that she and Albert are wearing court dress. Victoria and Albert's wedding had been a triumph. Nothing could have gone off better, declared Lord Melbourne. The newspapers agreed that the young queen had conducted matters perfectly. In doing so, Victoria had established an array of traditions still observed in weddings, royal and otherwise, to this day. From white wedding dresses to ostentatious cakes. Victoria wrote of her wedding night in her journal. We had our dinner in our sitting room, but I had such a sick headache that I could eat nothing and was obliged to lie down in the middle blue room for the remainder of the evening on the sofa. But ill or not, I never, never spent such an evening. My dearest, dearest, dear Albert sat on a footstool by my side and his excessive love and affection gave me feelings of heavenly love and happiness. I never could have hoped to have felt before. He clasped me in his arms and we kissed each other again and again. His beauty, his sweetness, his gentleness. Really, how can I ever be thankful enough to have such a husband? At half past ten I went and undressed and was very sick and at twenty minutes past ten we both went to bed, of course in one bed, to lie by his side and in his arms and on his dear bosom and be called by names of tenderness I have never yet heard used to me before was bliss beyond belief. Oh, this was the happiest day of my life. May God help me to do my duty as I ought and be worthy of such blessings. Victoria had the myrtle from her bouquet planted and a sprig from the bush was later carried by the future Queen Elizabeth II on her wedding day. Above all, Victoria raised the profile of royal weddings to an unprecedented degree. Never again would a king or queen marry in private late at night. The royal wedding ceremony had become an important part of securing the loyalties of the public. 
as recent royal weddings have proved this is still very much the case today. Victoria and Albert's subsequent children were later married into royal and noble families across the continent, earning Victoria the moniker, the Grandmother of Europe. Thank you for watching this video. If you have enjoyed it, then please give it a big old thumbs up. Don't forget to share on social media and also hit the notification bell so that you know whenever I upload a new video. Also, please do remember to subscribe to the channel. So from me in Shropshire, goodbye.